Uh, just want to say thank you so much to Dr. Newman for inviting me and for all the administrative work that's gone into this. It's been great. Um, it's so wonderful to follow Dr. Regian, who's talking on a very similar topic, but luckily I'm taking a slightly different angle. So uh, my title today is Sufi and Subalterns, Blacks, Women, and Slaves in Hagiography from Asulami to Jami. So, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, my talk is about the relationship between sainthood and subaltern identities in hagiography, particularly those identities that are intersectional. And I'm going to explain what I mean by intersectional, but essentially it's a term from gender studies which describes how an individual is subject to multiple dimensions of identity that are simultaneous and inseparable. For now, it will suffice to say that the idea behind this paper is to show that intersectionality theory from gender studies can help bring to fruition the potential of the subaltern method. And despite being a very modern theory, I try to show that intersectionality can be applied to medieval literature with productive results. Um, I ask of my texts, is there a difference between the way sainthood is constructed for those of the dominant unmarked class, so non-black Arabic-speaking males, and those with subaltern identities? Uh, what about those with subaltern identities that are also intersectional? That is, those that display more than one category of subordinated identity, like black women, slave women, poor madmen, old women. Um, my focus here is gonna be on uh, black women and slave women in particular. And uh, finally, what can such differences tell us about the compiler's attitudes towards the subaltern? Now, before we go on, I want to give you one quote which I feel really frames the discussion well, and that's the following from Jami. Um, so, whoever remembers God in reality separates from his aspect. And that's attributed to the Anun Misri in uh, the Nafahatul Ants. Um, this is one of the most explicit statements I've seen regarding identities in the hagiographies. To me, it implies that saints must lose any particularity of the self, including aspects of subaltern identity, in order to commune with the divine. However, the picture is more complicated than this quote would make it seem. Not all the subalterns in these texts are simply reappropriated into the dominant group by an erasure of their particular identity. So, I want to include a little bit here about why I've chosen intersectionality theory to complement the subaltern method, which has already proven its productivity. Um, one of the main practitioners of subaltern studies, Gayatri Spivak, has argued since 1988 for the need uh, for more attention to gender by members of the subaltern studies group. Indeed, she writes, in a collective where so much attention is rightly paid to the subjectivity or subject positioning of the subaltern, it should be surprising to encounter such indifference to the subjectivity, not to mention the indispensable presence of the woman as critical instrument. She continues to criticize historians of the group for tending, quote, not to ignore, but to rename the semiosis of sexual difference, class, or caste solidarity. In the subaltern approach, gender difference, she argues, has been subsumed by class difference. Her point is really well taken when we consider that only seven papers of the original 10 volumes of subaltern studies uh, show a explicit cover, explicitly covered gender. Um, but I want to take it one step further than Spivak. I argue here not just for subaltern studies to consider gender, but for it to look at the interaction between identi identity categories based on race, gender, class, nationality, disability, et cetera, as, as they relate to power structures. So in my case, as it relates to these hagiographers' construction of the saint. Um, I'm using saint as a loose translation of vali. I know it's not perfect, but that's just, for English usage, we'll go with that. Um, so this is where intersectionality theory comes in. Uh, quickly go over that. So what do I mean when I'm talking about intersectional identities? Um, intersectionality is a term co coined by legal scholar Kimberley Crenshaw to describe this, quote, simultaneity and multiple, mutual co-constitution of different categories of social differentiation. The idea is that identity indicators cannot be separated and treated piecemeal. The experience of black women, for example, cannot be generalized to stand in for the experience of non-black men, uh, sorry, non-black women or black men. Um, the theory has been used in fields as wide as law, race studies, 
political science, sociology, literature, and film. So now having an idea of the theory in general, uh, we'll turn towards how this applies to my sources. Um, the two main primary sources I'm looking at are uh, Abdul Rahman Ajami's Nafahatul Ans, uh, which was composed in Persian, and Ibn Ajawzi's Sifat as Safwa in Arabic. Um, and I'll also be making reference to Attar, uh, which uh, Dr. Rajin referred to, so that's Tazkirat al and um, the Dhikr and Niswa by Sulami. But um, those aren't going to be my focus for the simple reason that they've been much more worked on. And um, Jami and Ibn Jawzi are as yet untranslated um, and not worked on very commonly. So these sources are rich in their biographies of women in particular. So by my count, Ibn Jawzi contains uh, 240 women. So that's about 25% of the whole. Sulami is 84, uh, Jami has 34, and Attar, of course, has his lengthy biography on Rabi'e, which we just talked about at length. So, um, now as for the approach, I don't want to level the historical and contextual differences between these texts. I'm aware of them, but um, I won't have time to go into them here. So for now, I, I treat the texts as part of a very strong, coherent tradition which displays a rather surprising continuity of motif and theme linking them across the centuries. So that's why I'm taking a more structuralist approach, looking for patterns and motifs across the text. Um, so my basic argument here is that there's a difference between the, the way authors represent single axis cases and the way they represent intersectional cases. So what I mean by single axis cases is those that display only one element of subaltern identity. So um, black men, poor men, things like that. Um, intersectional cases, however, disp display multiple subordinated identities. So that's the black women, slave women. Um, but so in order to tease out the unique aspects of their relationship to sainthood, I will be comparing the black women and slave women to two single axis types, black men and non-black free women. So I argue that the hagiographers surveyed here display an awareness of the intersectional nature of identity in their texts. Their tendency is to simply reverse single axis indications of subalternity by reclaiming them into an unmarked dominant group. However, figures with intersectional subaltern identities are difficult to reclaim, and as such, the hagiographers often take a different approach. They compound the subject's otherness and transform this alterity into a badge of honor or an indication of spiritual superiority. So subaltern identities are therefore paradoxically portrayed as both inescapable and necessary to escape if one is to rise to the level of a saint. This uh, paradoxical attitude towards the subaltern, however, does not mean the cited authors here necessarily challenge the dominance of normative identity. Rather, it serves to allow them to valorize the exceptional few who transcend their identity while maintaining and upholding uh, traditional power structures. Um, so first, I'll take a look at the single axis cases, starting with black men. Um, in Jami's hagiography, a very small percentage of the saints therein are specified as having black skin. Um, by my count, there are only four male saints in the entire Nafahatul Uns whose blackness is alluded to. Um, with a total of 584 male saints in Jami's work, that means that black male saints comprise less than 1% of the total. Um, black male murids, or disciples, also appear, uh, as do black men in the margins of the text. Meanwhile, there are four black, slave, uh, four black female saints out of just 34 women, uh, it's about 12%, and many more that are described as slaves, kanizak, or jarie. Um, but not necessarily specified as black. Um, so Jami and Ibn Ajawzi's characterization of black male saints is really quite straightforward. They don't hesitate to establish a clear line between white and black. Whiteness is established as the norm, an unmarked social category, and is therefore the ideal way the saint would interact with the divine. Um, so this is particularly true for those that display single axis alterity. In the biography of Maimoun al-Maghribi, for example, we find a black saint whose skin turns white when he hears the Sama. Similarly, Abu Hamid al-Aswad turns white whenever he reaches the state of wajd, or ecstasy, and turns black again once he leaves it. These episodes could hardly be more explicit in terms of demarcating whiteness as the transcendental, unmarked status through which one communes with the divine. 
It is in this context that Jami offers his even more general statement regarding transcendence of any kind of identity, which I quoted at the beginning, whoever remembers God in reality separates from his, act, his aspect. While the statement is offered in the context of black saints turning white, we find it can apply, though not perfectly, to cases of women transcending their womanhood to take up positions as friends of God. So based on what we've seen with black men turning white, we might expect women saints to be reappropriated into the male domain in order to establish their, superior, their spiritual authority. But it's not that simple. As opposed to the black men who are recategorized as white, not all the cases of women saints can be so easily explained as instances of reappropriation. Uh, in the entries on women, we find instead that there's a, ten a tension between the biographer's attempts to wrench the saint apart from any indication of identity and transforming the marker of otherness into an indication of superiority. This double movement is paradoxical. In theory, subaltern must be transcended to reach sainthood, and yet the biographers routinely return to the subordinated identity and transform it into a basis for the subject's spiritual authority. <laughs> So we find a number of examples of women transcending their female identity and being masculinized. Um, this can explain Attar's famous statement regarding uh, Rabbi al-Adawiyah as a man of the path, which Dr. Regine just quoted for us brilliantly, so I don't have to quote it. Um, so there's no such thing as a woman on the path, so she's turned into a man. Um, the female state is reappropriated into the standard male domain. Um, Additionally, female saints are sometimes referred to as ustazi, or usta, ustadi, my male teacher or guide, often by male transmitters of their sayings and deeds. Uh, furthermore, there are extensive anecdotes showing women who uh, reject their presupposed social role, particularly marriage and sometimes motherhood. Um, for example, we find uh, Malika bint al munkadr rejecting a marriage proposal from Ayuba Sakhtiani uh, saying, I assumed remembrance of your Lord would preoccupy you from chatting with ladies. Apparently it didn't. Uh, <laughs> so this kind of rebuke is by no means uncommon in these sources. Uh, the question of marriage and celibacy, for women in particular, forms the basis of many a witty repartee between female saints and their would-be suitors. In the case of women, wit can be, used to make up, can be used to make up for their assumed inferior spiritual status and can establish their right to be cataloged and remembered among the friends of God. Um, okay, that's the Arabic for that, but I think we won't have time to look at it, but that's all right. Um, so the, the following story is from Attar's Tazkarat, and it turns on a similar theme. Um, the, a maiden here claims that she does not need to follow the prescriptions normally applied to her because of her sex, including covering her hair and not wandering around un unaccompanied in the desert. As she is, quote, intoxicated, she is separated from her gender identity and rebukes Khawas for trying to return her to her subaltern position. Um, and in a unique example from a Sulamis Dikr Niswa, we even find a woman lamenting her role as mother. Uh, so a, a female saint, Nusia, says, Oh Lord, you do not see me as someone worthy of your worship, so for this you have pre preoccupied me with a child. Um, now, despite the fact that women actively reject their social role in these texts, we also find numerous instances in which women's perceived disadvantage is transformed into an opportunity to prove their dedication to the path. Thus, the relationship between sainthood and subalternity is complex. Not only are women reclaimed into the dominant sphere of masculinity, their subordinated position can also be converted into an indication of spiritual authority. So for an example, we find in Ibn Jawzi a woman named Hakima who normally never leaves the mosque. One day, she is forced to leave because of the onset of her period, and as a result, she misses the, the Kaaba door being opened. It's a horribly traumatic experience for her, and the, when she hears about it, she uh, screams and screams until she dies. Um, now, and we find a very similar anecdote about Rabbi in the Tazkirat al where uh, she has her period, which prevents her from circumambulating the Kaaba after a seven-year pilgrimage. So in both cases, we see that women saints are inevitably brought back to their lower human form and reminded of their feminine physicality. 
Yet Attar's moral of the story turns Rabe'e into a heroine. He encourages the reader to show the kind of bravery that Rabe'e has in the face of her physicality. If Rabe'e can, ascend, can transcend the problem of womanhood, Attar seems to imply, surely the average Gnostic can reign victorious over his nafs. Now, Jami's general rule of distancing marked individuals from their aspect holds up well for those who are only marked by one type of subalternity. So those are the, the cases we've talked about so far, black men and free women. Um, it's simple enough to reverse a single category of identity and thus validate the saint by making him or her into part of the dominant group. However, the situation becomes more complicated when we look at the intersectional cases. We do not find examples of black women recategorized as black men or uh, non-black women. Neither do we find examples of black women transcending both aspects of their identity. Instead, we find authors piling on indications of subalternity, converting them into the nexus of low social status and using that to establish their spiritual authority. Uh, Lori Silvers explains this latter phenomenon in her description of the function of blackness in these texts. In some of these stories, she writes, black skin seems to art articulate the ideal of spiritual poverty by connecting the lowest social status and en enslaved black woman with the highest spiritual status. So on this point of amplifying otherness, take for example this slave woman who advises the well-known saint Vu Anun. Vu Anun asks her why she lives in a ruined Christian monastery and whether she feels loneliness. She is insulted by the question and reproaches him for questioning God's ability to fill her heart. Um, here we see that Far from distancing this woman from her subaltern status as both slave and woman, Jami actually reinforces her, her alterity, compounding her otherness by relating her to other sub, subaltern categories, including Christian. Furthermore, she remains anonymous in the text, referred to only as unknown slave girl, Jaria Machula. Um, I read this anonymity as another indication of being subaltern. Um, these accounts of anonymous women, unrestricted by prior sources, may in fact give us the most accurate portrait of the ideal woman saint, as envisioned by medieval male scholars. Uh, the number of anonymous women in these texts is percentage-wise of the whole much greater than the number of anonymous men. Unencumbered by personal identifying details such as names, dates, locations, well-known sayings, and anecdotes, the author is free to compose an image of the woman saint entirely bent to his own will or perhaps of his own invention. So this compounding otherness through emphasis on intersectional subaltern identity appears to be the biographer's chosen method to convey the link between social inferiority and spiritual superiority. Um, the idea is further enforced by the use of the term motabide in that anecdote. Here's the Persian of it. Um, so Cornell has already, Rakia Cornell, who translated uh, Asulami, the uh, Kronisua, um, she's already pointed out that Asulami seems preoccupied with the term ta'abud, to make oneself a slave or slave-like, and obudiya, literally slavery, which Cornell interprets as service, and uh, their association with women's religious practice in particular. So those who follow Asulami in the tradition of Sufi women's biography, like Jami and Ibn Jawzi, uh, take this metaphor to its literal conclusion and enshrine a number of their female friends of gods as actual slave girls. Of this tendency, Silvers writes, a common narrative trope depicts slaves used for sex, teaching their more sophisticated and sometimes scholarly owner a truth about God's love through their simple purity of faith. These well-known men are so humbled by the women's understanding that they release them. In this vein, slaves sometimes play a romantic role in the literature because their abject submission to their owners is analogous to the abject submission to God. I think that summarizes it really well. Um, so saints of multiple subaltern identities are, they're also particularly correlated to miracle stories. Um, Jami actually suppresses the fantastical backstory of some of the big name saints like Ibn uh, Adham, Bayezid, Bishr al-Hafi, even al-Halaj, we only find one miracle in most of these biographies, which is shocking um, when you come from you know, a perspective of reading Attar, where every line is a miracle. 
Um, instead, he cordons off the supernatural elements of these biographies into the realm of the subaltern, the domain of blacks, women, and slaves. Uh, this phenomenon represents another level of exotifying the intersectional subaltern. So while the black men associated with supernatural activity often appear only in the margins of entries about other saints, subaltern black women saints continue, continue to be strongly associated with miracles and magic, even when they are named and are, at the center, are the central subject of an entry. So the, mac, the male black can be a named saint or a nameless source of source, sorcery and magic, but not both. Uh, on the female side, such a simple reversal of blackness as the only identity marker is not possible. Um, they are too clearly other to be divested of identity markings and recast as unmarked. So the biographies embrace their subalternity and transfigure it. Um, Jami also suppresses the miracle stories of famous female Aliya, including Rabe'e, whose fantastic deeds in Atar's Tazkaratolia were almost certainly uh, known to him. So he reserves these kinds of stories, particularly for the realm of the less famous, the nameless, the intersectional saint, and the intersectional saints. Um, one really common type of miracle is the clairvoyance, or a miraculous recognition miracle, um, and it's associated particularly with black women. Um, a couple of examples will suffice here to make the point. Uh, a nameless black girl recognizes Du Anun, even though she's never seen him before, because, quote, the souls of his friends are his soldiers, recognizable to one another. Um, a similar example of miraculous recognition surfaces in Ibn Ajawzi's biography of Maymuna uh, Asauda, Maymuna the Black. Uh, Maymuna's future husband has a dream about her, and when he finally finds her, she recognizes him on sight, but tells him, go away, for this is not the appointed time. Uh, Maymuna's case is a perfect example of the phenomenon by which our hagiographers compound an intersectional subject's alterity by adding on even more indications of otherness. Maymuna is not only a black woman, she's also impoverished, deemed mad, majnuna, and it is implied a former slave. All of these indications reveal the additive nature of subaltern identity. So there's the Persian of that last one, if you guys want to look at it. Um, just to conclude quickly, uh, in the course of this paper, I have tried to show that the hagiographers represent the intersectional subaltern cases like black and slave women differently than single axis cases like black men or free women. While they tend to reclaim single axis subalterns into the dominant group, uh, they instead connect the lowest intersectional subalterns with the highest spiritual station. I hope this paper has demonstrated the need to look at more than just class when using the tools of subaltern studies and the imperative to consider the interaction between class, race, gender, and other differentiating factors. And finally, I have tried to show that the medieval sources are rich enough and the approach of inter intersectionality malleable enough to sustain a reading of these rather old sources through a very new lens. Thank you for your attention. So I think the, um, the intersectionality um, way about this is, is really important. And, uh, and I'm wondering what happens when you add into it um, another axis, the one of seniority, mm. that, um, that I think, especially if, you, if you're sort of privileging the main axis of gender um, yep. here, that that, that, that one is particularly important because of the fact that we're, it, it makes us look at gender as a spectrum Yep. Or I think that's a helpful way of looking at it. So, so what happens when you look at boys, for example, as being um, a, 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 having a, a different kind of gender from women in this context? Um, the role of boys or of ungendering as part of the process for men to become more saintly, for example. Um, anyway. Yeah, we do find a few examples of men ungendering themselves in order to um, becomes saints, but it's it's very uncommon. Um, I guess to answer your question about age, um, we find examples also of uh, older women, and these older women are kind of desexualized just by virtue of age, um, and so in that sense, they have 
kind of a, a direct link to the you know, top spiritual station because they're seen as you know, desexualized, ancient, so they have plenty of wisdom. Um, usually they're poor as well, and it's you know, one of these typical reproach type stories um, where she shows up some great uh, sheikh and shows her uh, superiority of knowledge and that kind of thing. Um, yep. Can I just go loud? Yes. <laughs> so um, the ways in which discipleship is often described, though. Um, yeah. I mean, this very is true. Regularly yeah. Discipleship is described as as, as um, using language that's, that's feminizing. So mm -hmm. where, where men become more like women, at least in terms of. Yeah. Life. So so I think there's. That has to be considered as... That's absolutely true. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, there has been an article written on this by Margaret Malamut. I can't remember the title, um, but she's gone into this sort of love relationship that exists between um, masters and disciples. And, um, and she looks really deeply into the actual sexual metaphors right. that they're using. Um, yeah, I think the, the problem is for me in these sources is that it doesn't really come up that way because they're not interested in the backstory of the saints. So we don't get much information about their childhoods. Um, if you look at Attar, he is really interested in the whole backstory and creating this narrative. Um, but my guys are more interested in conveying sayings and like the occasional anecdotes. So um, I don't know if the evidence would furnish it really for that analysis, but I, I totally know what track you're, you're talking about. Yeah. Carol? I just wanted to ask you perhaps a rather simple question, mm -hmm. which is um, you identify who are black. They're called Aswad, Soda, or Sia. Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean everybody else is uh, construed as um, white? Yeah, it's not clear. Um, so when they say that they're a slave, it's not, it doesn't necessarily imply um, blackness um, in this context. But you know there is a chance that it does. But because I'm looking at you know multiple layers of, of identity, when you have a, a female slave, that's already two layers of identity. It doesn't she doesn't necessarily have to be black as well. That's really like a third layer. Um, so is she called Abiyad then? Um, is she called white, or is she just left? Um, without a color description? Um, they're left without any description, typically, um, except for, of course, the, the, uh, the blacks who were turned white, and then they use the word sefid or abyat. Yeah. So there's no nuances there in the categories that are not black? I mean... Uh, not really, no, yeah. No. No, not particularly. <laughs> questions? We have a couple of extra minutes for coffee and tea, uh, so may I invite you to adjourn next door, where I think the coffee and tea and such has been replenished. Yes, it's currently it being finished to be replenished. Right, but this is true. Yes, this is true. And we will come back at about 12 o'clock. And in the meantime, thank you very much. Thank you.